Jesus and creation. You will hear a lot of talk sometimes about Jesus is really what we want. We don't want doctrines, we want Jesus. Um, Jesus apparently saw it a little bit differently. In John 7, 17, he says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, that word doctrine is didache, which simply means teaching. And obviously Jesus had some kind of teaching and he thought it was important for us to know whether that teaching was really authoritative or not. Jesus apparently taught, and that means he taught concepts, and that means that you can't get away with saying, well, we just want doctrines but Jesus. You're going to have to find out what the doctrines Jesus taught were. Now, we're going to find out today about what Jesus taught about creation. Uh, but before we do that, we need a background. First, I need to point out Jesus' attitude towards the Old Testament. Now, Jesus quoted the Old Testament a number of times, and he quoted it as if it was real. In Gen for Genesis 6 through 8, the flood story, Jesus said in Matthew 24, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, why they spelled Noah two different ways, it's the same way in the Greek, I don't know. Uh, but it's, if you read that story, it looks like Jesus just took the flood story as is, without uh, any critical comments about different sources and whether the flood really took place or not, he just assumed it did. Genesis 19 is treated the same way in Luke 17. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And then a little further back, further on, it says, remember Lot's wife, who of course got turned to a pillar of salt in the story of Genesis 19. Um, just assuming that the story was more or less uh, the way it was recorded. And mostly more. And Genesis 19 is also cited in Matthew 11 in a little different uh, circumstances. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in, the, in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Sodom existed. Um, just assume that's the way it was. No critical comment at all. And um, Exodus 3 is treated the same way in Mark 12. And as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush Mo God spoke Bake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, I am citing from Mark 12, but of course, that same story is told in all three Gospels, and, uh, you know, uh, with essentially no change. And so there will be parallels here. I'm just citing examples, not necessarily being exhaustive. Um, the Numbers 21 is cited in John 3, again, just off as if. It was a fact. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Just, there it is. Moses' story of lifting up the serpent in the wilderness is just taken as fact. Uh, 1 Samuel 21 is taken as fact in Mark 2. As, and he said unto them, have ye never read? Ooh, I mean, he's just flat out quoting, obviously. What David did, when he had need and was in hunger, he and they that were with him, how he went into the house in the days of God, in the days of Abiathar, the high priest. Actually, Abiathar wasn't the high priest at the time, but he was, that's, he's identifying Abiathar as living at that time. And did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave 
also to them who are with him. And again, just taking the story and accepting it at face value. Uh, the Queen of Sheba story in 1 Kings 10 is taken in Matthew 12 and run with. The Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jonah is taken again, literally. Matthew 16, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah's. And then he goes on to uh, use it again, although actually earlier in Matthew 12, but he answered and said unto them, an evil, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And by the way, that the Greek is the same for both of those. Evil and wicked are the same word. Um, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then he goes on to quote Jonah again. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So you have Jesus just taking the story of Jonah, um, what would now be called uncritically. Now, uh, he takes the Ten Commandments as authoritative. And um, somebody call, came, came to Jesus and said, you know, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he saith unto them, which Jesus said, you know the commandments, you shall do no murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor thy father and their mother, and interestingly adding it to these other commandments, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Just again, quoting this, the scripture as if it actually had authority. Um, Leviticus 19.18 again is quoted along with Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 in Mark 12 and parallels. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Interesting, Jesus added thy mind to it. And the second is like, Namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now, Jesus wasn't disagreeing with the popular mode. Jesus once asked somebody else, which are the greatest commandments, and he said the same too. So this is not actually new teaching. But the point of it is that both Jesus and his hearers, well, his hearers, you know, there were Jews that didn't really know any better. <clears throat> but Jesus considered it authoritative. Just quotes him, no apologies. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 17, 6, and 7, and 19, 15. It's not clear which one, or of course they were thought of as united in those days. In John 8, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. And uh, Jesus goes on to say, I have that testimony. Um, Psalms 82, again, is quoted. And this time with a little emphasis in John 10. Jesus answered them, it is, is it not written in your law, I said ye are God's? And he goes on to say, and the scripture cannot be broken. That's not the attitude that we usually see. Um, Jesus is saying that the Bible is true, and he's just accepting it pretty much as it reads. 
Uh, Jesus quotes Psalm 118 in Mark 12, and have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing it, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Again, quoting scripture as if it was authoritative. Isaiah 29, 13 is quoted in Mark 7, uh, verses 6 and 7, as authoritative. He answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Albeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus quotes Isaiah 53 in Luke 22, For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. What Jesus is saying is the application of Isaiah 53 to, him, to himself has his own backing. Notice that Isaiah, this is Deutero Isaiah, the second Isaiah. Um, and yet, Jesus gives no hint that there's any difference between it and the rest of Isaiah. Isaiah 56, 7, again, second Isaiah, if you're a skeptic. Comes, it gets quoted in Mark 11. And he taught them, um, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a, of all nations the house of prayer? That's a quote. But ye have made it a den of thieves. Now that's a quote also, but it isn't explicitly said, and you could say, well, he just kind of absorbed that from the culture or something. But the first one is clearly quoting scripture as if it was authoritative. Isaiah 61 gets quoted, and in Luke 4, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And you'll remember he goes on to say, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Taking second Isaiah and just assuming that it's correct. Malachi gets um, similar treatment in Luke 7, verse 27, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And further in Malachi, Malachi 4, verse 5, it, it is quoted in Mark 9, um, and parallels. And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. Presumably, um, some of that came from Isaiah 53 again. But certainly, he's quoting um, Math uh, Malachi 4, 5 there. By the way, everybody else knew that text too, and that's why they were asking, well, isn't, Isaiah supposed, or isn't uh, Elijah supposed to come? And uh, Leviticus 14 is quoted in Matthew 8, and again, authoritative. And Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Now I want you to think some, of something. This is a statement not just that it's in the law. This is attributing the law to Moses not to the priestly code. He didn't have to do that. It's recorded in all four Gospels, and I'm going to go give you one from um, Mark 7, which quotes Deuteronomy tw uh, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 6, the Sabbath commandment, and then again in Exodus 21:17. 
For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. The two, the two quotes, of course, are from the books of Moses, the priestly code, the one that's supposed to have been written mm, about the time of Ezra or something like that. Maybe about the time of Hezekiah, depending on who you're listening to. Uh, Moses again gets quoted in Luke 16. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. He's attributing the books of Moses to Moses. The Pentateuch does not seem to be a cut-up job here. That's the way Jesus regarded it. And finally in John 7, did not Moses give you the law? Not some nameless priestly person in the time of Ezra or of Hezekiah. And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go you about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast the devil who goeth about to kill thee. You're paranoid. Jesus answered and said unto them, as it turned out, if you read John, they said, isn't this the guy they're trying to kill? <laughs> so he wasn't paranoid. <laughs> I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Jesus was capable of making some distinctions. Notice he didn't say, Circumcision was because of the law of Moses. Well, it was kind of, but it actually started earlier. Uh, it came from Abraham. And, uh, and so he is able to make those kinds of distinctions, but he doesn't make them in the way that you would learn if you went to Harvard or Yale or Stanford or Bern or Oxford or um, Tubingen or any place uh, in academia today. Moses, again, in John 5, is attributed, uh, uh, the law is attributed to Moses. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For if he had believed the JEDP people, no, Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. He wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Jesus is uncritical, or pre-critical, or whatever you want to call it. Psalm 110 is attributed to David in Mark 12. For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Just flat out, that's David speaking. Not some unnamed composer in the time of Hezekiah or perhaps uh, Ezra. Daniel has the book of Daniel attributed to him in Matthew 24. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Who so readeth, let him understand. He's calling attention to this. Yeah, you know, you know what you're reading. It's Daniel. Daniel wrote that, not some unnamed Maccabean. Jesus today would be classified as uncritical or maybe pre critical. Scholars in academia would say he, you know, really didn't look at the Bible correctly. Well, how much authority do you think Jesus has? There is one place, actually there's a couple places, where Jesus uh, criticizes part of the Old Testament. He does he does make the Old Testament law tighter in some places. 
uh, in particular where he says, you've heard it, thou shalt not kill, but I say to you, don't get angry at somebody without a cause. And, you know, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, don't look at a woman to lust after her. Um, I'm sorry? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Um, but there is one particular place where Jesus criticizes part of the Old Testament and says it doesn't, it doesn't have much value anymore. Um, even here he does not say that Moses didn't write what he is criticizing, but only that it was not the ideal. And that's Matthew 19, 3 through 9, which uh, quotes, uh, uh, which is the same as Mark 10, 2 through 9. I'm going to use the Mark and uh, version, but uh, they both say basically the same thing except for rearrangement, which suggests that possibly Jesus said it in, in more than one setting. Um, but first, the, the Old Testament background in Deuteronomy 24, it says when a man has taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, and there was a huge debate over how, what kind of uncleanness was enough. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it to her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of her house, his house, he, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and give her a bill of divorcement and give it into, give it into her, his hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she is defiled, for that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. And the law basically says, if you're going to divorce, you have to put it in writing. Um, it's interesting to contrast that with the Muslim custom where you can say it three times and that's good enough. What this does is it makes it perfectly clear that the man no longer has any claim on the woman at all. And in fact, if she goes someplace else and becomes somebody else's wife, I suppose that if they reconcile afterwards that can be, that can be okay. But if they, if she gets married to somebody else, then you can't, that, that's the end of it, period. You can't get married to, uh, again. Uh, you can't marry one person, then another person, then back to the first again. That's considered abomination. So there's two things. One of them is you have to put divorce in writing, and the second thing is it's final. And you can consider that, in a certain sense, a good law, a better law than, than what the customs around were. But Jesus uh, said in, uh, in Mark 10, and the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him, testing. Um, the, uh, the other parallel says for any cause. And he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and put her away. The passage we just read. And Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. From the beginning is a quote. And male, God made them male and female is another quote. And then he goes on to quote Genesis 2. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And then Jesus adds his comment. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. And in the passage which is, which is quoted in most uh, Christian marriage is what therefore God hath joined together let not man put asunder 
creation, I want you to notice, is so authoritative for Jesus that it trumps the Mosaic law. Now this is different from some of those other passages that uh, where Jesus said, you have heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you. Notice Jesus doesn't say, but I say to you. He says, from the beginning it was not so, and then he quotes scripture. So this is not Jesus raising his own authority. This is Jesus using creation to trump the Mosaic law. Now, in one sense, it doesn't, in that if one does not divorce, that is, one follows Jesus, then one does not disobey the Mosaic law, because if you don't divorce, you don't have to put it in writing. But the Mosaic law clearly allows divorce, and Jesus clearly forbids it, uh, with one possible exception. In Matthew, it says, except for uh, unchastity, and uh, Mark and Luke don't give you that wiggle room. It's interesting to ask why the difference, and I think maybe the Holy Spirit preserved both, to get us to realize that if you're hoping that she'll commit adultery so that you can divorce her, you've already blown it. But in any case, it is very clear that Jesus has a very high view of creation. Creation has more authority for Jesus than any other part of the Old Testament. And if you accept that Jesus gave Moses the Mosaic Law, then it trumps that revelation too. Fascinating. Now, the, the other question that we can rise, uh, raise is, does creation encourage a high view of Jesus? Well, I think that it does. Creation was done by God in consultation. Remember, and God said, let us make man in our image. And it's very clear that that's plural in the Hebrew. And then, uh, um, it goes on to say, just a couple of verses down, so God created man in his own image, and now it's singular again. You have an interesting concept where you have a singular God and plural God at the same time. And of course, John picks up on that and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And of course he goes on to say, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, obviously referring to Jesus. It would appear that creation, in fact, puts Jesus with God at that point. Or certainly somebody, and it's not foreign to the Old Testament even, because Proverbs has a whole section on wisdom. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens. I want you to notice that, the, that it's not the word that's important, it's the concept. Because wisdom and understanding are parallel there, and it's meant to, um, it's meant to be uh, another way of saying the same thing. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and clouds drop down dew. And so you have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And logos would fit in with all of that. But to continue on, uh, there's more. I'm not going to take the time to read the whole of the first part of Proverbs but I'm going to read some of the more important things. Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? And now we have an uh, uh, something that might have been thought of as impersonal, kind of personalized. She standeth in the top of the high places by the way in the places of the paths. And then later on, she says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. 
When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding in water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there already. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, does that sound vaguely familiar? set a compass on the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable parts of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. That's the, the passage that most directly speaks to. Notice that he gave the sea a decree saying the water should not pass his commandment. And that kind of should remind you of Job 38 where, G, uh, where God comes in and talks to Job out of the whirlwind. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declares thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures of if thou knowest or who stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud a garment thereof in thick darkness a swaddling band for it and break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors and said hitherto shalt thou come but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. God said this. Then Proverbs said wisdom was with God at that time. And again, the name is not as important because wisdom, knowledge, understanding are all used in parallel. What's important is the concept. Now, having said all that, of course, the Bible presents a controversy. And there are two places where it's kind of recorded as, as, uh, as a beginning of it. One of them is Genesis 3 where the serpent is there. There's a hint of it in Genesis 2 where there's one, one tree that you must not eat of. But um, also, in Job, of course, you have Satan, who appears in Job 1 and again in Job 2, and interestingly, not since. And it's important to ask what the controversy was in Job. What was that issue? Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Where would you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Now, that sounds like kind of a nondescript thing to say, but in the in the ancient Near Eastern mind, this was what a king did in his, in his kingdom. I own the place. And the Lord said to Satan, not so fast. Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And so what is the controversy here? Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Of course he likes you. You pay him for it. But now put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. You see, you stop paying him, he'll curse you. He doesn't really love you. He just likes what you give him. 
And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put forth, put not forth thy hand. So, raises an interesting question. Did, um, did the Lord do this to Job or did Satan? <coughs> So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And of course, bad things happened to Job. And at the next meeting, there's a, another conclave. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said to Satan, yeah, we had this conversation before. Hast thou, not cons hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast to his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So the answer that God gave is that Satan moved God. It wasn't God making Satan do it. It was Satan making God do it. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse thee to thy face. We just, we didn't push hard enough. He can live without his kids, but he can't live without. You know, it's an interesting question um, why, uh, why when he took away his kids, he didn't take his wife away. But uh, um, because that's known to be the, the, the toughest uh, thing that a man has is to lose his wife. And, of course, the rest of the story gives you a clue as to why. Um, but the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Do anything you want to him, but you just can't kill him. And a little later you will hear Job saying, when all this is going on, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another. Though my reins, an ancient name for kidneys, and that's what it says in the Hebrew, be consumed within me. Now, some people will say this is the, the epitome of Job. Ah, there's a better day coming. And maybe I'll die, but God will raise me up and, uh, and it'll be all made right. Yes, kind of. It is the first book that talks about the resurrection, which, by the way, if it was written way back when, kind of means that the resurrection was at least thought about at the very beginning of the biblical experience. But... I would maintain that this is the passage that really was even more important. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. He, shall, he also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite shall not come before him. See, when, when Job said that, the claim that the devil made that there was not such a thing as love, that there was not such a thing as faithfulness, was proved wrong. And Job may have been confused in his theology. Let's face it, most of us are somewhat confused in our theology too. But Job knew that there was such a thing as love. And Job had it. Now, to go to Mark 12, Jesus 
has this same kind of thing. This is, in some ways, the center of Jesus' teaching. But Jesus called to them and saith unto them, You know that they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. And by the way, this is said in Luke in a different passage, in a different setting. It suggests that Jesus taught this more than once. But so it shall not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man, this isn't just me telling you what you need to do. The, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This is self-sacrificing love. And that is the center of Jesus' teaching. God had it. Jesus had it. You are called to have it. Now, it's important to contrast that with the theory of evolution. Because according to the theory of evolution, only traits that are advantageous to the possessor can be selected for. You think I'm kidding? I'm going to quote Darwin. If it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species had been formed for the exclusive good of another species, it would annihilate my theory, for such could not have been produced through natural selection. For Darwin, it's all what's in it for me and my kin. Everything else is worthless. And that's why peacocks can't be beautiful to us. They have to be beautiful to peahens. Because otherwise there's no point. And that's why this, the finding that peahens don't really care about what peacock's tails look like is devastating <coughs> to an evolutionary perspective. You see, we are left with two stories. One story has a God creating a world where carnivory is absent, that changed when sin entered, and God is planning to restore a deathless ecology. And that's not just Old T New Testament, it's also Old Testament. God identifies himself as love. God is love. John, 1 John, about four or five times, God is love. Jesus demonstrated God's love and calls us upon us to love each other as he loved us. And he goes on to say that if we would be perfect, we must love even our enemies. In a passage that's often been misinterpreted, you must be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, and people worry about are they eating the right nuts or something like that. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's in Matthew 5, the end of the chapter. Ye have heard it have, that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, which is of course a quote, and hate thy enemy, which is not a quote. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Command, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. The proof that God is love is that the devil is still around. Because if God weren't that way, the devil would not have a chance. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. That's the way it is in the world. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publican so. Jesus has contempt for the ethics of evolution. 
Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Has nothing to do with what we eat or any kind of ceremonial which day we keep, anything like that. It has to do with whether we love our enemies. It is directly anti-evolution, if you please. At least evolution in the sense of Darwinian survival of the fittest. Darwinian story, in contrast to this story, blesses nature red in tooth and claw as the way to get better and better organisms and those who exhibit self-sacrificing love, if they exist at all, are doomed to die out. We should not see anything of that except possibly as mutant freaks that aren't long for this world. And that is why there are so many articles trying to explain how altruism is really a more crafty way of leaving offspring. There's an article that, that tries to explain why people would make anonymous donations. And it's because when they're found out, they get extra credit for having done it that way. And you're going, in what world? But you see, there has to be an explanation because if there wasn't, then Darwinism would fail. But more importantly, what it says is that social Darwinism is in fact the offspring of Darwinism. If you like a dog-eat-dog -dog world, that's the way to go. Jesus thought the creation story had more authority even than the Mosaic Law. It is easy to understand Jesus if creation actually happened as described in Genesis. It is difficult, if not impossible, to under Je understand Jesus, at least understand Jesus as authoritative, if things just evolved, or if God got things started and allowed evolution to finish the job. That in this case, theistic evolution is no better than regular old evolution. And I would finish with the comment that if one wants to be a Christ follower, a Christian, a true Christian, and not just someone in the Christian tradition, one will take the Old Testament and the creation account in particular in a way that higher criticism would not approve. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Paul, for these good thoughts, stimulating thoughts. I'd like to make just two comments. One is that Jesus did more than just talk about creation. He actually demonstrated his ability to create. And I'm referring, of course, well, there were a number of instances. The most spectacular was a decaying body was brought back instantly to life. Um, Not to mention his own decaying body that was brought back instantly into life. Creating loaves and fishes. Uh, the miracles, some of the miracles were actually events of creation. Uh, yeah. many, many. The, the second uh, comment is the term deathless ecology that you characterize the initial creation that the Lord is going to restore. I'd like to point out that that is an overly broad term that does not actually fit the description of, of Canaan in that there was in fact death in, in the pre-fallen world. If we call the death of the biorobots, okay? yes, yes. So the well, Lord created biorobots and yeah. and the sentient obviously creatures. Obviously, their use of the term "death" did not include that. Of course. So, but when we use death, we have to be careful. Careful. Uh, but but I agree with you. Uh, Eating a carrot, we are killing the carrot. Yeah. Yeah. But a carrot is different from a dog. It really is. It's a biorobot. The microorganisms, vegetables, 
are biorobots and killing them, that their death is actually supporting the lives of the sentient creatures, the rest of creation. And that's yeah. just the way it is. <clears throat> that's the way the Lord designed it. Okay. Come in here and then here. And but isn't, uh, weren't vegetables a result of sin? <laughs> I mean, I try to explain this to my no, mom. No, actually they weren't. Humans eating vegetables were the result of yeah. sin. Vegetables as part of the diet was resilient. Vegetables were part of the diet for, for the animals. So that was no problem. <laughs> I think it is interesting that um, <clears throat> I was waiting for you to dwell on this subject, but you couldn't because it isn't there, that Christ himself did not belabor his own role in creation, just as he did not belabor the sanctity of the Sabbath, which has been something of a void and a disappointment to Adventists, and they have to give very lengthy answers as to why he didn't. And uh, likewise, he did not really belabor his, his function as participant in creation. John did in the first, chap first verse of the first chapter, but Christ didn't. The, most he claimed, the closest he came to it was to declare that before Abraham, Abraham was, I am. But um, and interestingly, in the Old Testament, it is belabored without end. In Isaiah, one of the most frequent thoughts that are given is how I, speaking as God, and in the Old Testament, it is interesting that syntactically he would take over and be the narrator almost without, uh, almost without introduction. It would just happen. Yes. It, uh, I created, I formed the O Israel out of my womb, and I formed the over and over and over again. But when he came on this earth, that isn't the line that he took. Uh, also, it is interesting that uh, the, the, the relation between God and Christ in the creation, let us make man in our image, is so frequently a matter of preposition which varies in version to version. And the one I think of, and I can't think of the reference, but I can feel pretty sure that it was the English Standard Version that uh, says, for we have one God, we have one Father, God, from whom all things exist and from whom we are, we, all things are made and from whom all things exist and one Lord, Jesus, for whom, by whom all things yeah. are and by whom we exist. Yeah, if I recall right, the second preposition is dia, through is a good translation of it. Um, I was just curious, um, you say that the creation trumps uh, the Mosaic Law. I, I was trying to figure out your reasoning for that. And second, the point about the devil being in Job, and you know he's about the only place except in Genesis where he's mentioned. Uh, there's scholars that believe that Job is actually the oldest book. That yes. means that means that story would be there when all the other prophets wrote things. Yes, including, so it's kind including of interesting. when Moses wrote uh, Genesis. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to see that even though that story was there, that they still didn't mention Satan very much in the Old Testament. So it's, it's kind of something to ponder. But can you tell me a little bit 
Do you know uh, where you're coming from as far as the Mosaic law being well, trumped by it's, the It's really story quite simple. Creation. Okay. Moses said, you can divorce and these are the conditions. Jesus said, yes, Moses said that. But from the beginning it was not so, with the clear implication that you're not to use the Mosaic law there as a ceiling, but rather as a floor. The Mosaic law was not ideal, that the ideal actually comes from the creation account. But did um, Jesus contradict Moses? Well, when Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, you shall not kill. But I say to you, you can't get angry. Uh, Matthew adds, without a cause. Um, Do you think that, he was talking contra- about behavior there? Is or? that contradicting the commandment not to kill? If you follow Jesus, you will follow Moses. But what Jesus is doing is saying there's a higher calling and in the case of the you shall not kill, he says, but I say to you, and expects he, you to just take it from him straight out. But in the case of divorce, he doesn't say, but I say to you. He says, but it's there in the book already. It's creation that points out that, that the Mosaic law was not ideal was not ideal. Correct. But that's a little different than trumping it. Well, if you're behaving in the way that Jesus asks you to behave, it is, in a certain sense, trumping it. It is saying that the requirement that I have is not the Mosaic Law. It is higher than that. Okay. Leonard one time shared with me the idea that the Old Testament was something that Jesus dictated, not dictated, just using that word loosely, uh, in order... It may have been dictated, actually, but... In order that when he came here, he would know the story of the universe, because how would he know if he's born as a When he's born as a baby and and not allowed those extra advantages, yeah. Which which, uh, is a pretty profound thought about it. But what it says is that if you go back to the Mosaic Law, you will see this. In fact, let me give you an illustration. You know, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy says, well, but who is my neighbor? Well, if the guy had read a little further in Leviticus, I think it's 19, uh, down to about to 33, it says, the stranger that lives among you, you're going to treat him as yourself and you're going to love him as yourself. And so the fact of the matter is the Samaritan that was going down the way should have been treated like an Israelite. He should have been loved. The truth of the matter is that it's all too easy for us even not to love the Israelites around us. But what he's saying is that anybody, uh, you know, gets that same love. So the, the, uh, the idea that the neighbor expands beyond, uh, Jesus was pointing something out that they all knew inside, really. And many of them just ignoring. I agree with you. Jesus, the Old Testament really does have all of the stuff that you need. The New Testament just simply makes it clearer. Yes. What I'm interested in is the way you approach scripture and the way you interpret. We have a fancy word for that, hermeneutics. Jesus apparently adopts a down-to-earth, very plain, simple hermeneutic and it probably speaks volumes to the people who have grown up that way, 
who understand it that way. There's not a lot of sophistication, but it it's sharp, it's pointed, um, it it really has power mm -hmm. to speak to the individual. So that's what Jesus chose. He could have um, maybe found esoteric meanings in some of the Old Testament passages. Now, if you go to Paul, you see Paul using some of the rabbinic methods, especially in Romans, but all through his writings. And um, he tends to um, allegorize a little bit Galatians, you know, and um, Cain, um, Ishmael being one example, and Abraham being an example of faith, and Ishmael. And Isaac and Ishmael. I yeah. Isaac and Ishmael. And all the way through, Paul reflects a, a more sophisticated approach, but it's correct. So one question I have is, um, with the current critical methods where you just tear things apart, they're very analytical, is there any way that people try and harmonize critical methods with what the simple and plain method of Jesus? Because let's face it, for about 1,700 years, uh, the average Christian uh, followed Jesus' method. And then all of a sudden, in the 18th century, you start seeing these critical methods pop up. And, and they're, they're, you can go many directions with them. That's the problem. It, scripture develops a wax nose. But what I was wondering, do scholars today that use the critical methods, especially evangelicals, do they try and harmonize their methods with Jesus plain and simple method well there, there's a couple of things one of them is the Middle Ages wasn't quite as uh, uh, pure and obvious as uh, I mean, if you read Origen and and right. Origen was thought of as a church father maybe a little out on the fringe a little bit depending on who you were but yeah. but you'll get the uh, there's four methods of interpreting scripture exactly. and and that was standard uh, uh, Middle Ages fair, mm -hmm. you know. So, so yeah, there, and, and in fact, one of the things that the Reformers did was they called upon the plain meaning uh, as being, you know, the authoritative one. Right. And so, in a sense, they are coming back to mm -hmm. the way Jesus mm -hmm. treated Scripture. And in fact, it's important because, theologically, you have to remember that one of the doctrines about scripture was, you know, the adequacy and all that, uh, you know, by faith yeah. alone, by, uh, by grace alone and so forth. But, but you also have the perspicuity of scripture, right. which means that you can understand it, mm -hmm. which means that Jesus is, if you want to call him using the common sense method, then the reformers are saying that's the method you should be using. Mm -hmm. So that in a sense, although not always applied as well as it could be, um, uh, in a sense, we're starting to recover the method that Jesus used. Um, and, you know, uh, I mean, even where Jesus talks about Daniel, which is, of course, the apocalyptic literature that he had, uh, he he just he just kind of well everybody knows what the abomination of desolation is or well no maybe not you have to read carefully yeah. whoso readeth let him understand but uh, you know by when the, when the time came Christians in mass pretty well figured out what was going on and they left and they didn't get killed in the destruction of Jerusalem at least the vast majority of them um, I mean there was a mass exodus and and apparently not too many Jews followed them because they didn't read and understand, I gather. Um, but Jesus is appealing to something that higher criticism would not like. And I think there's a reason for that. And the reason is that higher criticism does not like miracles. And if you take, 
if you take things that kind of straightforward way, wait a minute, people don't rise from the dead, you know that. Uh, the story of Lazarus must have been some kind of exaggeration. And it doesn't matter whether you find an original manuscript of Mark that says that, or an uh, actually in that particular case, the original manuscript of John, uh, because it couldn't have happened anyway. That just means that the, that the exaggeration started with John instead of with uh, one of John's disciples who'd kind of got let his imagination run, uh, uh, run riot. Um, the fundamental problem with higher criticism is not the method so much. The fundamental problem is the refusal to countenance the idea of miracles. And once you make that break, then the method virtually dictates itself. It would be the presuppositions that you start with. Yeah. And if you have a, a false foundation or a shaky foundation, you're not going to have the same results yeah. that you should be getting. And I can read you quotes from people of that era who say, but that's the big advantage of the higher critical method, is that you don't have miracles. That was the point. I don't know how you can talk about God without talking about miracle. <laughs> you know? People try. It's synonymous. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to just expand that, the direction we're going. Seventh-day Adventists started as a movement in the 1840s, actually. That's where our roots are. It's very interesting that Wellhausen, one of the chief higher critics, also started writing in the 1840s. And it's almost as if God was raising up a movement to counteract uh, Wellhausen and then his followers uh, shredding scripture into tiny bits and pieces and going from there. So either that or the devil was uh, raising up a movement maybe they were simultaneous chess pieces going after each other but you know we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater because there are some sound principles that those who use the historical grammatical method and those that use historical critical methods there's there's some common ground it's not like either or um, so we have to be careful, I think, on how we use it. How well, you, we you use think it. about it. They both have the word historical. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, grammatical and critical, the major difference is <laughs> grammatical seeks to understand what the text said mm -hmm. and then seeks to kind of take it as authoritative. Right. Whereas critical seeks to understand what the text said and then seeks to ask whether it is authoritative or not. Yeah, can it be trusted? <laughs> and yeah. presumes to say that if, 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 it, if it's noble human uh, uh, ideas, why, yes, it can be trusted. Mm -hmm. If it's talking about miracles, no. Uh, one more comment, and I hope some others will speak, too. Um, one of your slides on the screen mentioned uh, Jonah, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. That jumps out at me as the closest that Jesus came to using the allegorical method, because built into the story is not the idea of resurrection. Jonah didn't die. He was left almost for dead, and the people on the ship thought he had died. Yeah, if you read the text, do you think that he thought he was dead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was pleading with the Lord for his life. Um, do you want to comment on that? You know, does allegorism with parallelism have some legitimacy? Um, well, some people have said history repeats itself. And I think another comment was that history doesn't actually repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And I think there, <laughs> and I think there is yeah. some truth to that. Um, it's a little bit harder to be certain of what that is what is going on. 
you know, is there a parallel between Elijah and the last days? And is there a parallel between John the Baptist and the last days? Well, there seems to be some indication of that in Scripture. Exactly what that parallelism is is not spelled out in quite the same detail. Mm -hmm. But I think that the point that is being made is uh, Jesus just simply took this stuff and, I mean, he applies, you know, the, the, the days of Noah to the days of the coming of the Son of Man, which presumably means not when I'm crucified, but when I'm coming back. The point of the parallel is that if, if the event never happened, the story of Jonah never happened, that undermines the parallel with the resurrection. As that if is true. maybe that never happened to That is true. Comment back here. I've heard people sort of use a description of this critical method. They take the Bible seriously but not literally. An example that to help sort of explains that to me is if I if my wife asks me if I've been faithful, and I tell her, well, I take the Ten Commandments seriously, but not literally, will she be impressed? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, no, the, the thing of it is, what is stopping people from just simply taking it the way Jesus did is they can't believe that it happened that way. And, and that is the fundamental premise that makes higher criticism, higher criticism and not simply a grammatical historical method. You can't believe that this happened that way and therefore it doesn't have historical authority for you and therefore it raises the interesting question of whether it has any other kind of authority for you as well. So the, the prophets claimed, the Bible writers claimed to have been spoken to. Okay, is that true or were they simply frauds? Well, uh, if let, they, let's, And the middle ground is really not too meaningful. It's one or the other. It's difficult to make a good middle, middle ground in that situation. Uh, and most people have not been successful. Uh, and, and I think that the key is, do you actually believe that God can intervene or do things differently or however you want to say that in theological terms? And if the answer is yes, then he can. And if the answer is no, then you spend all kinds of time trying to explain why this, the biblical record seems to indicate that he did. Another comment here. When it comes to <clears throat> believing the theses that are put forward in the Bible, I think scientists, today's scientists, have a great advantage, those who study nature, especially biologists, because we see many, many phenomena that can only be described as miraculous in the world of science. You consider <clears throat> just a blade of grass or a piece of fruit, and you try to figure out how it all came about, and try, and you ask yourself, if you were in charge of making a banana, how would you manufacture it? And how does how does a tree, a cherry tree, come up with all those complex substances that go into the cherry to get that you're, flavor. You're starting to sound like God in the whirlwind asking Job. <laughs> I am. I am. And, and it's just mind-boggling. Right now, <clears throat> in my field, there is a serious effort to create living cells. Uh, they have made... We've got the DNA. Well, no, we've gone much farther. <clears throat> they have got liposomes. These are artificial sphere, spheres, and they introduce DNA and uh, RNA and the translating me translation mechanism, and, and they energy. create enzymes in there and energy yeah. process processing uh, uh, enzymes and, and so on. And and they they have created, for instance, the latest in 2016 
someone has produced an eight-step process of lipid synthesis in vitro, in, in, in kind of in, on the surface of a liposome. And they are overtly stating that nothing stops them now to just make it more sophisticated and create cells, artificial cells that will be alive. And so I, I applaud this effort because it is going to bring scientists, these scientists face to face with the question, what is life? And how it is how difficult, if not if impossible, to create, but they have to get to that point. So, so my point is that scientists are <clears throat> looking at miraculous events, and when we attribute this to the Lord, it it doesn't surprise us that He pulls up a few stunts here, once in a while. Well, I think that's a good place to. Uh, well, we uh, will. Um, we have one more comment here, and then maybe, uh, unless there's more, we'll just uh, close just, it at that. Just to follow up on these, all these experiments to try and create life shows how you design something. Uh, could it happen all by itself? Is the real question. Well, you just mix liposomes and, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm mm -hmm. amazed by, you know, James Tour uh, comments on how, you know, he designs these little tiny cars and he, he says, you know, there's no way this happens on its own. You have to work at it. You have to work really hard at it. Uh, yes. In, in 1912, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jacques Loeb, who was one of the early biochemists, wrote, it doesn't seem, uh, I'm not quoting verbatim, but essentially what he said was, there doesn't seem to be any reason why we shouldn't be able to create life, artificial life. And in fact, biology must produce life or explain why this is impossible. <laughs> it, that part is direct quotation. And so <clears throat> it's a wonderful statement because it challenges biologists to, to show that they understand biology by creating life. Or if they cannot create, they should understand why they cannot do it. Well, we don't do either right now. <laughs> well, one more comment in the back. Well, there's a story that some people are talking to God and they tell them, well, we can make molecule, we can make all kinds of things and you know, we get the carbon and the, and the oxygen and the, put them together and, and God says, well, no, wait a minute, you, you get your own stuff. You can't start with what I made. <laughs> well, uh, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but the fact of the matter is we're having trouble doing it even, I mean, the, the people who are making these liposomes with stuff on the, on the outside, not the inside, Yeah, they're, 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 these are on the outside, not the inside. Right. In order to make it work, you need to have a cell that actually has them on the inside, right? Right. And so this is the first step toward yeah. trying to get them inside the right liposome. These are the I only mean, technical difficulties. I think they should be. Yeah. They will be able to do it eventually. From, from, a, from a scientific point of view, we can't say until somebody tries whether we can actually succeed with, at, at this or not. What is clear is that it takes incredible um, precision to be able to do that. And uh, the idea that, that it just kind of happened on its own just does not make any physical sense. 
Well, what you just said today, what you presented, this is such a beautiful message to share with our Muslim friends. They believe that the world was created in six days. And the Quran talks about Sabbath, at least in four different places. Um, and they also believe that the world was created by the word. Well, who is the word? You see? Muhammad. No. 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 Uh, uh, no. How do you know that Muhammad did not keep Sabbath? Not Jesus. Be, be nice. They have more respect for Jesus Christ than many of the Christians. Be nice. Yeah. They, actually, not, they don't. No. Actually, it's, it's interesting because Muhammad was not, was not the only man who did not sin. Jesus was. Yes. Jesus is coming again, not Muhammad. They believe, they believe that Jesus is coming back. I mean, they, they believe this, you see. So they might be better Adventists than some of us. I'm sorry. You know, well, I mean, uh, certainly, certainly those of us who um, have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, uh, <laughs> you see, maybe, uh, you know, as, as Jesus said to his Jewish friend, uh, thou art not far from the kingdom of heaven. And these are not, listen, I, I have not counted myself. But I'm told by a gentleman who became a Adventist, his lawyer in LA, Iranian. And he says that there are 20 of the 30, 28, 20 of the 28 fundamental beliefs that we have, we share with the Muslims. But with the, with the Protestants, we share only 13. Come on, with whom do we have more, more commonality? Uh, we, I, I, well, of course, of course, uh, Jesus being authoritative uh, is probably Im important, and unfortunately, sometimes that doesn't come to practicality. Um, and I think that um, at least Islam, as it is taught commonly, is not very big on loving your enemies, uh, no. and. Well, maybe they're not following the Quran. But yes. then, then let's be fair. There's a there's a portion of Christianity that has kind of forgotten about that teaching too. Oh, absolutely. So, um, but you know, that's the real attractiveness of Jesus is that he was consistent on that point. Surely. That uh, that our job is not just to be nice to the people who are nice to us, but it was also to be nice to the people who aren't nice to us. And uh, who says that so many of these folk are not nice to us? I, look, in just a few more days, I'm flying into another, on the other side of the world, and I'm going to be t t with very educated Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists, and when they, especially when the, when the Muslims find out who is Seventh-day Adventist, are, they'll say, you're a better Christian, than, um, you're a better Muslim than I am. Uh -huh. these, are, these are educated yes, yes, people. Yes, yes. Educated it is, people. It is a standard so, reaction. Exactly, and so we do not fight with these folk. We find our common grounds and we work with them. Yeah. Well, the same way we would deal with any other uh, person, uh, other Christians. Uh, in fact, I would argue that if we're dealing with atheists, we should find common ground and build on it rather than going in to destroy everything. Um, I may be wrong about that, but it seems to me that that makes more sense than trying to just uh, tell everybody you're wrong and just you need, you need to quit and you need to listen to what we say. Growing up in the Adventist, I, I think there's an apathy that we have among ourselves anymore, you know. It's sad what you see around the world, and uh, hey, we are, just leave us alone, we're fine. He said, no, we have been told to go into all the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, in some ways, the atheist world is the most difficult one for several reasons, one of them being that you can't use the Bible as authoritative because they refuse to accept that 
But I think there's another one, and that is that there's the sense that we don't need your God. And simply sharing in science and then pointing out at appropriate times that you actually do. Yeah, like uh, the gentleman there says, well, you know, in 1912, it really stuck with me in my brain. You know, if someone says, hey, prove and uh, make life. Yeah. You know, if you're a biologist, you feel, say that this world just came about, then go ahead and create lives. Make something, make a life out of nothing. If you show, cannot... Show how simple it is. There you are. Show how simple it is. I mean, it's more than a hundred years and they have not been able to do this. Yeah. Well, next week we will be uh, doing, uh, looking at uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria and the flack that came out of that uh, from a peer-reviewed article and I, th I think that uh, it will be interesting and revealing.